قَالَهْ بِطَا مِنْهَا جَمِيعًا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوٌّ فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًى فَمَنِ اتَّبَعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا يَضِلُّ وَلَا يَشْقَى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات آمالنا من يحدي الله فلا مدل له ومن يلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم My brothers and sisters in Islam and my brothers and sisters from Adam alayhi salam I always like to start my speaking engagements by thanking the people who invited me because when we don't thank the people we don't thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so thank you brothers and sisters who participated for the sake of Allah and made this thing possible for me to be here the hospitality has been amazing Alhamdulillah. And may Allah reward you all. <clears throat> I go by the name of Amir Junaid, formerly known to many of you as Loom from Bad Boy Records. And for those of you that don't know me, you know, I used to be very, very successful in the music business. I was a successful songwriter. I was a successful artist. I wrote over 52 top 10 hits. I sold over 7 million records worldwide. I was able to travel the world and see and experience many, many things. I was born and raised in New York City in the streets of Harlem. For those of you who don't know, Harlem is like the mecca of many of the things that influence music and entertainment today. We were the epitome of those things. And growing up in this type of environment by default, I was always exposed to a very dark side of life that consists of immense crime, violence, drugs, etc. And by being exposed to these things, many people who share this harsh reality, we all, found, we all, we all sort out to find a way to escape this harsh reality, whether it was by way of playing sports, by way of excelling academically. But in more recent times, many of us developed this ability to rap and write songs. For myself, I never was really influenced by music growing up. I was more so influenced by the individuals in my neighborhood. Many of the brothers who indulged in selling drugs, committing crimes, you know, and things of the likes. And this was the more dominant impression that was left with many of the youth in my community, even myself. And by default, we fell victim of these same activities that took place in the community. So this became my first teacher. My first teacher, I was exposed to drugs and violence. And growing up, being a young kid is very hard to express the emotions that come with living in these harsh realities. And at certain points you feel so secluded from anything that may give you resolve that you start to bottle up all the emotions and frustrations that come with living in this type of reality. So for myself, you know, I dabbled in sports. I was pretty good in school, wasn't the greatest student. You know, I knew how to count money though. You know, so math was something I got easy. But I developed this ability to write. And many of you know from your early, maybe secondary school, the format to writing, which is to have a setting, a body, and a conclusion. So I took this understanding from school, and I started to utilize this format in a, in a more therapeutic method of dealing with my day-to-day -day hustle and bustle of being in the streets. So what I would do, I would write down exactly what I was going through. And after a while, I started reading these things and it started to remind me of how hard it was. So then I started to include my imagination into this writing and started using my imagination to resolve some of these affairs. 
Then gradually it started to turn into rhyme, and gradually it started to turn into songs. So I went through these steps for a period of time before one day my talent was discovered in the least likely way. You know, I was standing in front of a building doing something I shouldn't have been doing, but it was a brother that I was very, really, very tight with, and I remember, I remember going inside the building and leaving my book. And it was a guy that was selling like this car. He said it was clean. I said, okay, it's clean, I'll pay for it. So I bought this hot car. Well, lawyer, yeah, I didn't even make it down the street with the car. And I got arrested. And the same brother who was standing there with me told me not to get in this car. But me being hard-headed at the time, I got in the car anyway. And I got arrested for grand theft auto. But when the brother came to pick me up from the precinct, which was very noble of him at the time, because a lot of times in the street, you believe your friends are your friends until you really have a problem, then you quickly find out who your friends are. So it was very noble of him to come to my rescue at the time and bail me out of prison. But the funny thing is when he bailed me out, of course he beat me up for like five, 10 minutes with the I told you so. And I had to take it like a man, because he did tell me. But he started reciting things to me that sounded so familiar, and I was like, hold up. That sounds like something I wrote. So I remember being very shy and very bashful because you know this whole macho thing and a lot of you brothers out there, y'all know how it is when you're around the other brothers. You want to try to keep your chest poked out. You know, you want to put extra bass in your voice. You want to sound like you just don't have no problems and nothing can harm you. You know, you know how it goes. I call it the poker face, you know. So by trying to, you know, Conceal the emotion that I was having hearing this guy recite some of my darkest and like my, my, my most deepest emotions, something that I kept concealed. And I was only using this as a therapeutic method to, you know, suffice my own issues dealing with the streets. So hearing him saying, I became very shy. And after the told you so, I was expecting him to kind of like slander me or beat me down about, you know, this, this hidden talent that I had. But really, he encouraged me. He encouraged me, he said, yo, this is dope, man. Like, you should really continue doing this. Like, you should pursue this. And I'm looking at him like, yeah, right, just give me my book. You know, just, just give me my book, man. I don't want to hear all that. So I took his advice. You know, I took his advice. And I started to pursue writing. And I was writing and writing. And a lot of times, you know, people would discover my ability to write, and they would always say they knew people, I know somebody that could probably help you, I know somebody, I know somebody, yeah, whatever, you know. Never really took it serious. But I remember the first time I had an opportunity to write a song, and it was in 1995. I wrote a song for Shaquille O'Neal, out of all people. And, uh, many of y'all probably remember when Shaq thought he was a rapper, right? But I wrote some of those songs. And I started doing this ghost writing for years. I never really had any intentions of being in the spotlight, never had any intentions of being, you know, in the limelight or anything. But I ended up, my career really took off is when I met, you know, Sean Puffy Combs and I signed to Bad Boy Records. And from there I wrote a lot of songs that were very big and they became very international smashes. And I was exposed to a market that was so broad that it surpassed my own perception of what I thought success was. And it happened so fast that I wasn't even prepared for what was yet to come. Because a lot of entertainers, you know, and I can speak for many of them, especially coming from the ghettos, we have a very short range perception of what success is. We think m mainly about like secular countries like in Europe, you know, France, England. We think about reaching these kind of markets. We never think that this stuff can be propelled into, you know, you know, um, markets that are predominantly Muslim countries and things of this nature. So by having all this success and all of the wealth and the glitz and glamour that came with it, it quickly started to have like this reverse effect. Meaning that in the beginning, it was something I was thriving for. In the beginning, it was something I wanted so bad. And I had very pure intentions. You know, I wanted to just get my grandmother a house. I wanted to buy my mother a house. I wanted to help my sisters get through school. 
A lot of you don't know, I was a parent at 16 years old. You know, my oldest child is 19 years old. She's in her second year of college, like some of you guys here today. You know, I have a kid in school, same age as some of y'all. I was 16 years old. So while some of y'all at 16 probably was playing Xbox or doing whatever you was doing, I was buying Pampers, you know? I was buying milk. I was up in the middle of the night trying to rock somebody to sleep, you know? So responsibility started to come in my life by default as well. So basically, when you get the opportunity to fulfill some of these desires, and they're good desires. You want to do good for your family. You want to do good for the people that supported you through all the hard times, going to the studio, spending 17 hours in the studio, and never eating, never sleeping, just going through all this hard work. And you want to try to return this favor to those who supported you in all of this. But once you accomplish that, that's when you come to this fork in the road. That's when you start to realize, where do I go from here? What else is there to do? And this is when I used to seek refuge in material things. You know, you get frustrated, I just go buy a car. You buy a car, you get used to all the gadgets, you know, you get it up to 120 a couple times, and it's like you're over it. It's like it's just a car now. You know, you go buy a chain. Then you see like somebody in another, you know, rap circle or something, maybe 50 Cent or somebody in his crew got a chain that's longer with more diamonds. Then you go back to the jeweler, you get yours a little bit longer with more diamonds. And it's like you become, you know, and eventually your chain be on the floor, you know. You know, you gotta pick it up, put it in your pocket sometimes, you know, it just becomes ridiculous. Your watch just hides your whole hand. It just becomes real gaudy and just unnecessary. You just start looking really crazy. You see rappers walking around with strobe lights on. It just looks ridiculous, you know? And this is when, you know, you, you notice that we start competing in wealth. We start competing in materialistic things. And at the end of it all, there's no benefit in it. And then the most saddest part about it is once you get over the thrill you have to start living vicariously through those who are less fortunate. Meaning I become a vampire, so to say. I'm not thrilled about it, but you coming around saying, oh, that's not a Ferrari? Like, oh, that's a, you never seen a Ferrari? Like, you know, I, I have to kind of like extract my joy from your excitement. To me, it was just a, a red car. But when you come and say, oh, is that a Ferrari? Is that the new such and such and such with the, with the, you know, with the super kit? And all you start naming all this stuff with the dual exhaust. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's the, yeah. And in fact, yeah, that's the Ferrari. Yeah, you know? You want to take a ride? Now, you know, so we had to start living vicariously through those who were less fortunate. And this is what the music business was designed to do. It was designed to glorify just the short-lived you know, saying glorification of a lifestyle that's not consistent in everyone's life. You know? If every rapper was as wealthy as they glorify in these videos, how come when we look through Forbes 500, we only see like two of them? You know what I'm saying? You only see like maybe Jay-Z or 50 Cent and Puff. But there's a million rappers out there and they all got yachts, they all got helicopters, everybody got all this stuff and it's like, why are you all in out in Forbes? And these are some of the hints that this is just glorification. This is just something that's being glorified, that's being over-exaggerated. But the sad part about it is the reality that comes with it a lot of you guys don't see. Because the music business is only designed to show you one aspect. That's it. And there's a lot of money being made just glorifying this one aspect. But no one talks about the death toll. No one talks about some of these young women, you know, who are underage and they go places and get fake ID just to try to be down, quote unquote down, and they end up having a guy slip a date rape drug in their drink and they end up getting dragged off and raped. No one talks about her story. No one talks about the guy, you know, who got a little too drunk, a little too loud, and security guard break a walkie-talkie over his head and drag him out in the alley and he dies from a concussion. No one talks about this guy. No one talks about the guy that gets stabbed in the club. No one talks about the shootout in the parking lot. No one talks about these things. And a lot of things, you know, the youth don't know is in the music business, 
It's not a lifestyle, it's a death style. It's the exact opposite. Because every day I used to be risking my life, risking my very life. I don't know how many times I used to kiss my kids and you know hug and squeeze them before I go out on a tour, knowing that I may be going to foreign countries, going to places where they might have crazed fans. It might be somebody that might be a fan of Suge Knight or something when I was down with Bad Boy. He might be in the crowd somewhere want to kill me or something, you know? These are all the things that we used to have to face just so we can continue entertaining you. And then the most sad part about it is that all the things we glorify, a lot of the guys in the music business are not even willing to do. But you, you stupid enough to go out there and shoot somebody. I don't know if y'all ever seen 50 Cent's house. They got like 22 rooms. You think he's trying to go out there and shoot somebody? You think he's trying to throw away all of that? No. But when you see this glorification of this type of lifestyle, it, it, it takes people through this, this, this realm of where they try to do all these elusive things and all these extreme things to obtain just a piece of it. Just a piece of it. And sometimes we detach ourselves from everything that we know to be morally true. And in most cases with some of the young Muslims today, you detach yourself from your religion, chasing something that you know is an opposition of what Islam teaches us. So the reason why I'm talking about these things is I feel like it's something more universal, something that we can all relate to, being quote unquote Generation X. You know, that's what they call us in the United States. We're Generation Unknown. But we are the next generation. And a lot of us are inspired by things that have no benefit. So while traveling the world, this became my education. The last grade I completed was the eighth grade. Eighth grade, I've never seen a university to now. I'm sitting in one now talking to university students. But I never filled out an application. Never applied. I had the money to pay, but didn't have the, you know, the credentials or the academic achievement required for me to enter a university. So my experiences in life became my education. And I used to read a lot too. I used to love reading, you know. But by traveling the world, I remember doing a song with a Lebanese artist by the name of Masadi. And Doing this song with this, this, this brother, at the time, I didn't really think it was going to do anything big. You know, this is a Lebanese guy. You know, I'm doing songs with Tony Braxton and Snoop Dogg and all these major people. And it's like, who's Masardi? Is that why I'm saying his name right? Is it Masardi or Masari? What is it, Masari? Like, you know, but the guy, they had the money. So I said, okay, I'll take the money for Masardi. <laughs> Masardi's pain. Then I kind of find out later in Arabic, Masardi means money. So I'm like, hey, I was dealing with money from the beginning. Hey, Wasadi, for loose, cash, dough. I'm with all of that. And the record never even reached the American market, so it was kind of like a one-off that wouldn't tarnish my, my exclusive track record of doing songs with all these A-list people. So it didn't tarnish my credibility with the A-list stars. So OK, brush that to the side. But then I started getting calls from places like Muscat Oman, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Kazakhstan, are you serious? These people want me to come out there? No way, I watch the news, I see how it goes on out there, I'm not going out there. <laughs> you know, I'm American, and I'm ignorant at the time, so I don't know anything, I'm looking like I'm not going out there, are you kidding me? Can't even hear the commentator, all you hear is shooting in the back, I'm not going out there. <laughs> Every time you see the news, there's a guy like, yeah, and it, 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 it's, it's me. There's heavy fire in the background, and yes, you know, they're trying to, yeah, they're trying to evacuate some civilians. They're like, I'm not going out there to do no song. Are you kidding me? The stage must be bulletproof. <laughs> but when I got there, I saw the exact opposite. So before I get into this description of what I saw, I want to take you a little bit back to New York City and how I was always exposed, you know, to the presence of the Muslim. 
Because New York City, is, most of you may know, some of you may be American, some of you may be from Britain, you know, from what I hear, so many different cultures and ethnicities and things that, you know, make this school very diverse. But New York City was the same way, you know. We had the uh, Yemenese brothers, they used to, run, they used to um, own most of the like, local grocery stores. You know, the West African brothers, they own most of the cab services and stuff. You know, then, subhanAllah, the Pakistani, you know, they, they owned all the pharmacies. <laughs> all the pharmacies. <laughs> Absolutely all the pharmacies. <laughs> then, you know, you had Indian brothers, they were the doctors. You know, how could I help you? I'm like, okay, you know. <laughs> I have a fever. They pull out this long needle. It's like, hold up, doc. Like, where did you study? You know? I'm just like, you know, this, is, this, is the, this was the very minute perception that I had, you know, coming from where I'm coming from. You know, I'm coming from ignorance. I'm coming from a place where, you know, we use what we got to get what we want. And this is one of the mottos that we, you know, we, we used to use coming out of the ghetto. It's like, you know, we use what we got. If you're a good talker, man, you talk your way to the top. You dance, you dance your way to the top, man. You can rap, rap to the top, play basketball, man. You better jump over the moon, do something. But we use what we got to get what we want. So my perception of things was very vague. I just, you know, very one-dimensional, so to say. But the one thing that was significant about these experiences that we all shared something in common. We all lived in New York City. We all was in the ghetto. We was all in Harlem. So these were my brothers in the struggle. You know, so I never had any negative, you know, vibes or negative relationships with nobody. Even though sometimes the West African brothers in the taxi, they can be a little aggressive, you know. You get in the taxi, say, hey, take me to 125th Street, Yaki. Because, you know, we, even, even as non-Muslim, we used to call the Muslims Yaki. Or I used to call all the Muslims Muhammad. SubhanAllah, hey, Muhammad, how's little Muhammad? How's, how's mother? How's other Muhammad? How's your brother Muhammad that went back to Yemen? How's, everybody with Muhammad. You know, so I was very ignorant. I didn't know no better. I just, you know, from the kid from the street. That's it. So you get in a taxi, West African brother. You say, hey, take me to 125th Street. You know, you're driving, get a phone call, something changed. Oh, you know what, Aki, could you stop on 137th? No, you said 125th. I calm down, calm down. No, you get out of my cab now. Like, relax, man, relax. Calm down, calm down. Ain't you supposed to be a Muslim? Then relax. You know? So this is, this is the way my community was, you know? And we can laugh at these things, you know? And in most cases, when I used to be young and struggling as a parent, and I would come up short with money for Pampers, I would always go to the Yemenese grocery stores, and they would give them to me, you know? So I was like, you know, I'm it's my brothers. So even in that state of ignorance, when certain things used to break out, the Muslims would be blamed. Everybody in my neighborhood, we'd be like, no, we're going out with the Muslims. Yo, they come over here with that, we're going we to fight with the Muslims. Like, we didn't know no better. We just like, yo, they, you know, it's like our family. You know, we come here, they treat us right. We go over to the pharmacy, even though we ain't got the, the best insurance, but you know, we might get some painkillers, you know? And this is just the way it was. So me growing up in a Christian household, you know, my grandmother, she was in the United Negro College from choir. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a very big gospel choir, 35 years. They should travel all over the U.S. and some places out the country you know, singing the gospel. I used to spend six days a week, six days a week in the church. So a lot of times when I hear people say, yeah, I'm a Christian and I go to church, I went six days a week. I was in Cub Scouts, I was in Bible studies, I played the piano, I was an usher, I was in church six days a week, you know? And it wasn't like I was one of the kids that just sat through Bible studies. I used to actually read and try to study the understanding of the Bible. And I started to stumble over certain things, even as a little kid. Even as a little kid, I used to stumble over certain things. And I remember asking my pastor a question. I remember asking him, I said, listen, um, pastor, I want to ask you a question. You know, if Jesus is God, then, you know, then why does he pray? And he just chewed me up. Like I asked like the worst question in the world. I was just a kid. If he prays, then you know, how is he God if, we, if he's praying? Boy, you don't believe in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. And I said, calm down, Pastor. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I'm trying to get my finger on if he's submitting himself to something, I want to do what he's doing. I want to follow him. You know, I don't want to worship him because, you know, coming from the street, we can identify with, street, with strength and weakness. 
You know, we can identify with someone who's strong. He stands firm in you know, all situations. You want to ride with him. You don't want to ride with the guy that one shot in the air and he's running. You got to run behind him. You want to stand with the person that's strong. So this figure was a symbol of strength. But seeing him submit to something greater than himself, it sparked a question in my heart and in my mind. And when I asked about it, I never got a straight answer. So at that point, I stopped going to church, and I just decided in my heart that I'm just going to believe in God. I said, I'm just going to believe in God. So now, back to my trip. I'm visiting Muslim countries for the first time. I'm realizing I don't need a bulletproof vest. I'm realizing that, you know, they have palm trees. They have things that symbolize cool. And when I got there, I started to see a whole different perspective of the Muslim. You know, because in America, you know, media propagates a lot of images of everything. Everything, even me being as an African American. You understand? I know what it's like to be singled out for everything wrong. I know what it's like to be you know, a part of a, a, a family who's upright. My grandmother was a beautician. My grandfather spent 30 years in the army, he was the first black captain of his regime, and things. In. So I know what it is to have a good family, but to step outside your house and be profiled, or step outside your house and be blamed for something you didn't even do, or step outside your house and have this stigma that you, you just trouble. So I know what it feels like to be singled out. You know, but this wasn't the perception I ever had of anybody else. I never walked around with hatred in my heart. I never walked around with hatred for nobody, no race, no culture, no, no creed, never. But I did have tainted images in my mind of what certain things meant. So being able to travel to a Muslim country, I saw a totally different perspective of what a Muslim was. And I saw different mannerisms and characteristics of a Muslim that blew my mind away. I seen brothers that was wearing all white thobes and gutras, smiling, greeting each other, hugging each other. And I said, SubhanAllah, this is, this is, this is, this is different. And any of my non-Muslim brothers and sisters that's here, y'all know, we used to think that somebody has to die and rise into heaven to see people dressed in all white. You know how it go. You die, oh, you just rise up. There's a guy at the podium, but you know, like he's taking your, you know, you're your putting your name on the list, like, you know, hey, you, you made it, huh? Like, you know, you got on white, everybody got on white. Everything flying around isn't white, everything is just white. But I'm very much alive and very much awake, and I'm seeing that this, this characteristic is something that's living. These were people who had great manners, and I was around multi million dollar people who were stingy. Multi-million dollar people who wouldn't even give you advice, and advice is free. So to be around a culture of people who were giving, and they were giving for the sake of Allah. You know, I remember even visiting the Muslim brother house, you know, the, the guys that hosted me, they took me to this Muslim brother house, and his hospitality was amazing. I came in the house, he was like, here, the fuck do you Like, what the fuck do you mean? I'm pointing at the tap in the brother, like, what the fuck do you mean? You know, I'm still a little ignorant, like, that mean kill me? Like, you know, what does the fuck do mean? Does that mean get his feet? Because I see the F in it, like, what the, the fuck do they <laughs> Like, what the fuck do is he talking about? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. But he meant sit. And when I looked to where he was pointing, he was pointing to the best chair in the house. Like, here, the fuck do sit? Here, have tea, have shy, have this, have that, have that. And I'm sitting there accumulating all these gifts, and I'm like, nobody gives me nothing. I'm just ready to cry, like, Nobody ever gives me anything, you know? And unless it, I mean, unless it has an ulterior motive, you know, no one gives you anything unless they want something, you know? And you have to decide if you're willing to give before you accept, you understand? You're looking at the gifts and it's like, okay, this looking like he might want a couple of VIP tickets or something, I don't know. What, what, what's your angle, Aki? What, 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 what are you giving me this for again? You know, and people used to game me, no, 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 just being nice. You ain't just being nice. You want something. But for this brother, he didn't want nothing. He was just giving me stuff. And I'm watching his house disappear, and all the stuff he's giving me is just starting to disappear. And I'm like, you know, if he keep giving me stuff, he ain't gonna have no place to live. You know, who's that nice? Who's that hospitable? 
You know, I'm thinking this guy's going, you know, pop up at the club later on, like, yo, remember me? I gave you 17 dates, three books, a couple glasses of water, some tea, remember me? Yeah, just me plus three, we good? Like, it wasn't that, it wasn't no angle. It was just good hospitality. And all of these things started to take precedence, even when I went to Kazakhstan. Now, you know me coming from Jahalia, I'm thinking Asian is Asian. I never knew that Persians or Pakistan, I didn't know that was Asian. I thought Asian was Asian. I thought you had to, well, I, I'm not trying to be funny, but I thought you had to be like Chinese, or you had to look like you know, Jet Li or something. So I'm in Kazakhstan, and I'm asking, I hung out with the president. Well, I, I was with the president out there, and I remember asking him, like, listen, you know, how y'all say what's up? And I'm making I'm like, how y'all say what's up? What up? Like, you know, how y'all, how y'all, you know, what's popping? Like, how, how, how y'all say that? La salamu alaikum. Like, get out of here, man. You Chinese, man. You don't say that shit. <laughs> you know? I'm getting my ears all ready for some other stuff that I could use as a mockery to joke with people. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, you know, make up some stuff. Like, you know? But he said, Assalamu alaikum. And I'm looking at him like, come on, man. You ain't serious. You don't say salam alaikum. He said, no. Nah. Salam alaikum. It means peace be upon you. I said, I know what it means, man. I'm just don't, it don't look right coming out your mouth right now. You know? I had my ears set up for some other stuff. I had the record button and everything ready because I was going to go back to the, you know, Chinese restaurants in my neighborhood or the laundry mats and start, you know, picking at them. But he didn't give me nothing to work with, man. He gave me salam alaikum. I said, well, okay, why well, are you But this was showing me the diversity that came with Islam. Because remind you, I'm going to remind all of y'all, no one talked to me about Islam. You know, I accept this religion only by Allah's guidance. And I mentioned this earlier when I did my introduction, which is a part of the Khutbah al hajjah you know. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to say, Yahdi Allahu fila mudalala wa min yulil fila hadi Allah. Whomsoever Allah chooses to guide, no one can lead them astray. And whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. That's simple. So you got to understand, as Muslims, we don't make Muslims. Only Allah makes Muslims. All Muslims do is convey this beautiful message of monotheism, of worshiping one God and one God alone. And this concept was something that I stumbled over many times in my life as a Christian. First commandment, thou shalt not place no other God before me. That sounds like God wants to be worshipped alone. Thou shalt not place no other God before me. There's even a verse in Isaiah where he says, You may know me and know that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. For I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. And that's in the Old Testament. So once again, that sounds like he's negating that there's any partner or anything associated with his greatness, with his majesty, is him and him alone. Because a lot of y'all, y'all students, Muslims and non-Muslims, you can relate to what I'm about to say. You're a student. You spend four years, four years working hard, busting your butt to get his professor an A. And he turns around and gives you a grade to the janitor. How would you feel? How would you feel? Four years, you done lost sleep. You don't even forgot your name sometimes. Left your keys a dozen times. But you made sure you had your books. You made sure you had everything to, you know, suffice this, 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 this need to have this grade, this need to pass. And they give everything that you work for to the least likely candidate. This guy over here who does nothing but mop the floor, he gets an A. How would you feel? That would bother you. That would bother you. Same way some of your parents who may have spent all this money. And you decide on your fourth year you want to drop out. How do you think your parents feel? Like, subhanAllah, we invested all of this in you and all of a sudden you just went left. What type of gratitude would that be? What kind of appreciation would you be displaying? So when you take that to another level, when you look at your creator, your creator created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. No one helped them. No one assisted them in this creation. He created it all. But you turn around and you worship this podium. 
How do you think that will make your creator feel? You get sick, you call on a saint or some other person like, he created you though. He was your creator. Who knows you better than the one that created you? He actually decreed that you would be sick that day. So would it only be incumbent upon you to return back to that for the cure? If he decreed you to be sick, then that means he can decree your wellness. And this is the simplicity with Islam. So when I ran into this truth, by way of visiting Muslim countries, by way of being able to bear witness to the characteristics and mannerisms of the Muslims, the, the, the hospitality, the culture, the everything, and then when I heard the Adhan, that pretty much almost sealed the deal for me. You know, because I was an artist. I used to spend hours on top of hours in the studio trying to make songs that make you look stupid in the club. So you could just be dancing around like a crazy, and, you know, you just bugging out. Some of y'all can't even dance. Y'all just there, just looking stupid. <laughs> I remember that dumb dance. I used to be in the club. People, the point dance was like, subhanAllah, what is that? You know, and I'm just sharing my state presently. And then I'll show you later on in the talk the beauty that came out of that. Because all of us are adults, and we're all going to come to forks in the road, and we have to make sound decisions. So in my case, I lived a life of falsehood. I lived a life of violence. I lived a life of crime. You know, In my society, I'm considered a failure. I'm a predicate felon. I'm an eighth grade dropout. I'm considered a failure. So when they have little applications that say, have you ever been convicted? I just walk out. It don't even make no sense putting a check there. It don't even make no sense lying. Because who am I? These people might have some real type super system back there. They punch up and say, well, sir, you know, you don't qualify for the job. You know, unfortunately, we looked at your criminal record and, you know, you've been arrested for many things. This job is not for you. You understand? So I can only resort to the talent that I had. So it wasn't about raising my ego, giving fuel to this alter ego. I was loon since I was 13. That's a nickname I got for being in the streets. Loon, short for loony, from the Adam Brothers, Majnoon. Yeah, I know what Majnoon means, crazy. You know, I wasn't this hopeless romantic guy that needed a girl every song. That was me just taking that opportunity there and trying to paint a better picture of myself. Instead of glorifying the streets and the killing and it, like, why? I lost many friends. I lost family members to drugs, to violence. What I look like going to glorify that? You understand? That's just like if somebody stabbed and killed my mother in cold blood. And I take that very knife and dip it in gold and put it on the chain and walk around with this symbol of death on my neck. Like, what sense does that make? Glorifying something that hurts. So when I ran into Islam and I discovered the simplicity that comes with it, I didn't have to change myself too much. You know, just the way I live and just the way I understand my purpose of creation. I didn't get too holy for my friends, you know? I'm not above anybody. Being a Muslim doesn't mean I can hear through walls. I can jump over buildings. It doesn't mean that. I'm human. I'm deficient, just like every human being in here. I have deficiencies. But what Islam establishes is a means of dealing with those deficiencies because our Creator knows He created us with deficiencies. So by His mercy, He gives us ways to deal with these deficiencies. Legislated proof. And he sent us a messenger, like he sent many messengers before, from the nations before. And as Muslims, we show no distinction from none of the messengers. We don't worship Muhammad. He's a man. He's a creation. Do we follow his way? Yes. We try to, I mean, to the best of our ability. And that's what you have to understand. You don't judge the truth by a man. You judge the man by the truth. Because if we sit there and try to distinguish what's true and the shortcomings and the actions of a human being, we'll never find the truth. We'll never find the truth. And that's the problem sometimes. We're always looking for something tangible. We got to touch it to believe it. You know what I'm saying? We have to see it to believe it. 
Well, we've been given proof. We've been given the Quran. And there have been messengers that came before and books that came before. And this is only by Allah's mercy that he's always sent a warner, a clear warner, a guide to lead a nation back to worshiping him and him alone. Because you already know the capacity of the human being's um, emotions and their thoughts towards another human being. And I'm going to give you a prime example. And I mentioned this yesterday. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson sold over 25 million records worldwide and Thriller. He's been singing since he was six. He dedicated his whole life to entertaining and pleasing his fans. When Michael Jackson died, the Michael Jackson craze lasted two weeks. Y'all wrote Michael Jackson off like a used car. So that goes to show you that when your intentions are to please people, when it's all said and done, you're going to get exactly what you intend. And at that point, based on that scenario, the people showed exactly how much they care. That's why as a Muslim, everything we do is solely for the sake of pleasing the one that created us, because that's the only one who can reward me in the life after this life. The only one who is the bestower of that mercy. So I only seek refuge in him and him alone. Even if you turn away and say, look, you know, me is a sucker. He gave me too much change. I don't care. My intention wasn't to please you anyway. It was to please my Lord. So all of you people out there that may be inspiring to be a rappers or musicians, you're not going to surpass Michael Jackson. A lot of while them. But, you know, look what they did with Mike. Y'all all saw it. Y'all was on TV, people crying, Mike, we miss you. They had on the glove, this the shiny glove. Mike, we're going to miss you. Cass was out there. I mean, you seen Persian guys with straight hair. All of a sudden, out of Jerry Curl was out there, pop lock, and everybody was out there just showing their love for Mike. Two weeks, man. The earthquake in Japan got more of your attention right now than Michael Jackson. You didn't even care about Michael Jackson anymore. And that's sad that people spend their lives trying to please other people when the reward you will see in the end. I used to see it all the time in my hood. Lord Ray Ray get killed. Everybody walking around the rest in peace Ray Ray shirt. We gonna miss you Ray Ray. Word man, Ray Ray was real man. Ray Ray killed seven people in December. Man, Ray Ray was real. As soon as that shirt hit the laundry machine, nobody care about Ray Ray anymore. <laughs> Nobody care about Ray Ray. So the beautiful thing about Islam is this call of Tawheed, monotheism. And as students, you all know what the word mono means. One. One. Because even as kids, we all wanted to seek refuge in our mom. Am I lying? You bump your head, your head bleeding, and you run past seven band-aids, six pieces of gauze, three bottles of peroxide just to get to your mom. And there's people that can help you, like, yo, let me help you, let me, put, let me stop the bleeding. No, get off me, I just want my mom. You just want to get the mom. You just want to get to that one source. You don't care about nothing else. You don't even feel the pain as soon as you get to your mom. You got your head is cracked in half. You just sitting as soon as you give a mom, it's like, mommy, what's this? You know, you want to, you know? But it's like, as a kid, you understand what it is to have one source. But as an adult, you know you can't run to mommy no more, even though some of y'all still might. <laughs> you know, I left my house at 15. That, that, I don't even, I can't identify with that. You know, I had to fend for myself for a very long time. But I do understand what it's like to run to mommy. But as an adult, who do I get to run to? You know, who's going to be sufficient for all my needs, all my deficiencies? all my shortcomings. So when I found Islam, Islam spoke in volumes. Islam spoke to me in ways that it made it very easy for me to abstain from everything else that I thought had a value, everything that I thought meant something, everyone that I thought meant something. 
It was the easiest trade in my life. It was the fairest thing I've ever did. And I was at the height of my career. I wasn't in no downslide. I wasn't short on cash. I didn't have any problems. I wasn't diagnosed with no terminal disease or nothing. It wasn't like no desperation move. I need to be a Muslim. No, it was the truth. And the sad part about it is some of us are in denial what the truth may be. Some of you have even discovered it, came face to face with it, but it doesn't coincide with your desires. So you put it on hold and chase what your desires tell you to chase. I did that for you. That's why I'm sitting here as an example that I did that for you. I tried everything you're trying. I did everything that you're trying to do. I did what you shouldn't be doing. I did what you're attempting to do. I did what you thought about doing. You know, I did a lot of stuff. You know, to be forgiven for these things and be given a clean slate. Entering the fall of Islam. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. From that day, all my bad deeds were removed and turned into good deeds. And I got a clean slate. So now I'm held accountable for everything I know from this point on. You can't get that with no Oprah Winfrey remix or like no Jenny Jones makeover. You can't get that. It doesn't work. You change your hair red and call yourself strawberry. Sister, it's not going to work. You know, you can stop being Muhammad and call yourself Mo. It's not going to change. I know about these little quick fixes. Everybody thinks it's a quick fix. I'm going to go with the Mohawk this month. No, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. There's always going to be somebody that knows you, spots you. Hey, Henry, that's you. <laughs> Who's Henry? I don't know who Henry is. You don't try to change your voice. Come here, man. I know you is, man. You know? So, alhamdulillah, you know. <clears throat> I guess I just wanted to share just a little bit of the mind state and the emotions that came with being who I was and coming to you know, this beautiful religion of Islam, you know. And I hope that this can be a reminder, not just for the Muslims, but for the non-Muslims as well, to reflect and ponder on your purpose of creation, why you were created, why are you here? This has to be a question that crosses your mind every day. Why are you here? What was your purpose of being created? Was it for you to just enjoy life the way you see fit? Is it just for you to just, I guess, you know, burn yourself out and then once some of the things that you thought had value don't have value no more, now you want to settle down? I know all these scenarios. I've been around all these people, you know. Once guys start getting gray hair, they, you know, they don't feel like they're hot no more. So it's like, I need to just really you know, try to go track down Judy. She used to really be in love with me. I hope she still is. I'm going gray, I'm losing my hair. Hopefully she'll like me. You know, women as well, once the, you know, the thrill is gone, you're not the hottest chick anymore, you're the old chick in the club now. Now you wanna get married. Yeah, I'm gonna be real with you, I'm from the street. You know, but alhamdulillah, I'm a Muslim, you know. But these scenarios, you know, they're real. We can be in denial all we want. But these are real scenarios, you know? Some of us feel like we're not fully accomplished in sin before we make this decision to do what's right. I, need, I still got a few more things I need to do. You know, I haven't had Cristal yet. Maybe I'll be a Muslim after I you know, have a couple bottles of that. Like, it's like, you know, people just feel like they're not fully accomplished in sin yet. So I still have a few more kinks to get out before I start considering what I know to be true. And it's in your heart. This is your fitra, this is your natural disposition. You're created to know that there's only one creator. You know this. If you were sitting alone on an island and you've seen the sunrise, sunset, moonrise, moonset, grass growing, you know ain't no man doing that. That's instinctive. You was already created to know this. The choice is, are you going to testify that it's true? Are you going to make that commitment knowing that this to be true, that there's only one created, there's only one worthy of worship, there's only one, there's only one, and there's always, always been one. It's never been two or three, it's always been one. 
Alhamdulillah, since I've been Muslim, my grandfather, he's 89 years old, he accepted Islam. My son, he's 14 years old. He was at the height of being Loon's son. Motorcycles, he had it all. But even he's seen it. I didn't convince him. I wasn't even in town when he became a Muslim. And most of my friends and relatives, they just see the consistency and the, and, and the sincerity of what I'm upon. That he's serious. And everybody that ever knew me knew I never was a follower. I wasn't nobody looking to be nobody else. I was happy with being Loon. I was Loon since I was 13 years old. I wasn't confused about my identity. Y'all didn't see me with seven different haircuts through my little career. I had the same haircut, the same style, same swag. I was just me. I was happy with being who I was. That was me before you met me on TV. I was always, you know, cool in my skin. You know, some of us have identity issues. And that's one of the biggest issues of growing and going through transition from adolescence to a man. You have this, you know, you have to shed the boyish image and try to grow into this man figure. And that becomes confusing for some of us, you know? Some of us start reaching. Or look like another man, or, you know? Now they be lost. Sometimes you might not even want to look like a man. Stuff for the while. But I just want to open up the forum for all of y'all to ask questions, and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. I'm not sitting before you as no scholar. I'm not your sheikh. You understand? I'm just a Muslim. I'm just a servant of Allah, a slave of Allah. Being a slave of Allah frees me from any other form of slavery. I can't be a slave to drugs. I can't be a slave to nothing else. I'm a slave of the Most High, not the Son. Not the child, I'm a slave. Because even sometimes if you just change that one linguistic meaning from son to slave, your relationship would be a whole lot better. Because sometimes thinking you're the son, it makes you very lackadaisical. And I'll give you a scenario. If your father had a job, he ran a business, he told you, his son, to come to work at 8. You show up at what? 8.30, 8.45, 9. Sometimes you don't even come. Why? Because it's your dad's job. It's your dad. Dad to get over it. It's just dad. That's how you think. Instinctively, it's just dad. Dad tell you don't take his car out, you take it out anyway, you get one little scratch on it, dad to get over it. He has another Cadillac. But if it was your boss, subhanAllah, this man has no relation to you. You don't have the same blood flowing through your veins or nothing. This is just some guy that graduated from some Ivy League college, and he's your boss. He said get to work at 6, you there at 5.45, and you got his coffee in hand. You a sucker, it's like, hey, hey, boss, how you doing today? You don't even like him, you just bring his, I got it just the way you like it. Three sugars and milk, I got it just the way you like it. See how easy it is for you to submit for something that you think will be a benefit for you? See how fast? Your first day of work, you're taking gum from under the table, you're doing all kinds of stuff. Five years on the job, you walk around with your Mickey Mouse slippers. You're comfortable now. But in the beginning, you was on pins and needles. Pins and needles. You know how it is. You be in the office, paper clip flight. You be sending paper clips and fighting. The boss is coming in. Everybody get by a terminal. See how quick it is you obey? When your check is involved, when your pension is being questioned, when you're great, subhanAllah, these are the things you need to reflect on. Ask yourself, what are you willing to submit to versus what you should submit to? And I hope someone asks questions along that vein. Don't be shy, please. I am a normal human being. I cannot judge or critique no one. I am Layman Damon from Lamesville, USA. I am nobody. I am just a Muslim. And I pray that Allah makes me better than however you may see me. You know? And I'm going to end this on a statement by the best of creation after the Prophet ﷺ was Abu Bakr al-Sadiq. Radiallahu an. He said that I am no better than any of you. And if I was to do that which is right, then aid me. And if I was to do that which is wrong or in error, then rectify me. And this shows you the humbleness of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And may Allah increase us in his humbleness. May Allah increase us in character. May Allah increase us in everything that is pleasing to him. And may Allah protect us from all things evil that he ordained and protect us from the evil of ourselves. The evil of ourselves. And for my non-Muslim brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you into the fold of Islam, guide you to that which is correct, guide you to this beautiful religion of monotheism, guide you to this religion of diversity, guide you to this religion of the oneness of the only creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in it. Guide you to this, 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 this brotherhood that is expanding by the minute, by the second. In America alone, we have a quarter million reverts a year. And we don't have evangelists. There's no one on TV saying, you know, you can you know, join Islam for $13.99. Three installment pays to $3.99. You can be a Muslim. Like, there's nobody selling Islam. There's no bus going by with a guy on there saying, take your heart of the day. Like, it's not what's going on. As Muslims, we only are, you know, we only are, you know, tempted and it's incumbent upon us to just convey this message. That's it. You know, that's it. We only here to say that Islam is the truth. Islam is the haq. Deen al haq. This is, this is the truth. It's the religion of truth. That's it. You only here to tell you that you only have one created, and he loves you, even by his mercy. He wakes even the, the ones who don't believe. He wakes you up every day, put air in your lungs. He suffices your hunger. He provides the provisions for you. You ain't going out getting it yourself. I hope you don't think because you put in 40 hours last week, that's why you ate. If that's what you think. SubhanAllah. So, inshallah to Allah, you know, <coughs> You know, very difficult trying to generalize a talk and be fair to everyone. And may Allah reward me and all the brothers for trying to conduct ourselves in such a manner because this is one of the characteristics of the Muslim. But just so I can identify with my audience, inshallah, I want to ask by show of hands, how many brothers and sisters here are born and raised Muslim? MashaAllah. Now, how many brothers and sisters here, such as myself, reverted to this beautiful religion of Islam? It's kind of dark up there. I think I see about 10. Uh, Alhamdulillah. And the reason why I use the term revert, because convert is, 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 is not the term that's used. Revert means you're returning back. Convert means, you know, for someone to be introduced to this beautiful religion and convert to something other. Revert means you're only returning back to your natural disposition. And your natural disposition, your natural inclination is monotheism. Monotheism. Mono, one. It's not complicated. You understand? To have one source and do any and everything to the best of your ability to please that one source. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al rahman He is the most merciful. The most merciful. Jazakumullah khayyidin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.